Hello, Rob Lager and Austin Heath here today to talk about the infamous eye bar, this prosthetic that's growing in popularity where you have a titanium bar with a zirconia superstructure. And uh, there are plenty of benefits uh, that we'll talk about, but also there's now some problems to to solve and to consider. You have two geometries that you're fitting together, right? You have a titanium bar that has a certain shape and geometry with a zirconia superstructure, and you can run into problems with your, your nesting and your milling strategies. And today I'm with Austin Heath, and we're gonna talk about the eye bar prosthetic, uh, why it's growing in popularity, and what are some of the common problems you can find and, and solve in the, the nesting and the milling strategy to make sure you have a, a really awesome fit. So Austin, why don't you talk, us about, uh, talk to us about eye bar, uh, why you love it, maybe show us a case uh, that that uh, that you have prepared, and then we'll look at uh, millbox strategy and some common pitfalls to avoid. Sounds good, and thanks for having me on, Rob. I really appreciate it. I really enjoy these uh, interactions. So yeah, today we're gonna talk about Ibar. It's a very common final prosthetic for us. We always deliver final prosthetics with a titanium substructure. Um, so what we do is we split our final approved design into a part that will mill in titanium and then again a part that will mill in zirconia. And so I think the first challenge is the design of these bars and making sure that we are designing uh, a passive fit so that these teeth and the substructure of the bar, when they come off the mill, they just fit perfectly together. Mm. Um, so challenge number one is design um once that is achieved and uh you know you could have this perfectly designed passive superstructure and substructure then we have to manufacture it yeah. um and a lot of times we're using mills to manufacture these prosthetics mill pr perfectly is is required as well just to get this perfect bar and and sleeve design and you've done a few hundred of them, right? And why don't you show us, uh, you have a video there you wanted, you were going to show us, show us this case, talk us through it and talk to us about how many that you've done and what you've learned along the way to achieve this, you know, perfectly passive fit between your titanium substructure and your zirconia superstructure. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I do work in a clinic. Uh, we've delivered uh, about a hundred to 150 of these um, titanium bar cases. Um, these again are our final prosthetic. Um, and then I've, I've trained, uh, as far as Australia and Ireland, uh, remotely how to do this design process. And, and through that, I've helped, uh, design and manufacture probably close to 500 of these, uh, style bars. Uh, so on screen here, uh, this was kind of early on in the millings and stages and was really impressed with how these two structures fit together uh, out of the mill. So you can see, you know, zero gap between the superstructure uh, and the substructure and just how well they fit together. Um, one thing I do want to point out here, you'll notice that I've sort of strategically placed the sprues on the titanium bar on surfaces that won't be cemented to uh, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to, let's say, grind uh, a sprue down to get these two objects to fit and uh, and really what we want to see is this every time just the the bar in that superstructure of the teeth where we manufacture both zirconia and PMMA superstructures but when they come together it should just be this perfect like a glove fit um, and that's kind of what we want to see every time uh, and, so and with that you know like I'd said it starts with the design of the prosthetic and then I think the very next step is going to be taking those designs and putting them into your nesting software um, so on the screen I've got a case that we've done in Millbox uh, it's actually a case we use for uh, some samples so I've milled this case quite a few times um, uh, but I've had them both nested in in two different ways in Millbox there is a, uh, an object or a part type called the cavity access. And that's identified here as this pink arrow. And then you have undercuts that can be visible. These 
uh, dark blue shadows. So the majority of these undercuts are going to be automatically taken care of by Millbox. Uh, but what I want to show you is on this other arch, I have that cavity access set improperly. So, you know, you can see quite a bit of undercut on one side of this arch. Um, and we've we've gone ahead and calculated and in, in Millbox and in Hyperdent, you can do what's called a simulation. So this is the simulation side of CAM and it will show you all of the different tools used, the name of the toolpath uh, and the order in which it will use those tools. And uh, what we've done here is we've let it run all the way through the simulation and then I'm calculating what's known as deviation. So the difference in the STL and the result of the mill. So uh, on screen, you'll see this kind of green gray camo. That is the effect you see when you have a perfect milled restoration. So in the interproximal areas, you can see, you know, maybe if we had a, a bit smaller tool go in there, uh, it could get a better definition. But it, in this instance, it's left a little bit of material on the interproximals. Um, both of the occlusal surfaces of these superstructures look perfect. But if we roll this uh, to look at the cavity side, you'll notice one of them we zoom is in perfect. There. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we've got one superstructure that is incredibly perfect. The whole inside has been taken care of. Nothing has been left behind. But let's take a look at the other one. And you'll see, again, on that same side where we had that shadow, uh, it's kind of got this varying shades of blue. Uh, which here on the right-hand side, you can see that's identifying the level of deviation. So uh, if we, in fact, ran this mill job or job in the mill, uh, it would have left behind all of this material. Um, and coming back to, uh, let's go back to the video, we just wouldn't see a fit from the substructure and the superstructure uh, like you see on the on the video. You would have one of the two parts holding it up. So uh, in this case, we've shown the superstructure, but in fact, this simulation and evaluation of what the mill is going to do needs to be done on both the bars and the superstructure. So I think that's a, an important part of just the, making this restoration come full circle. So you get an approved design from the patient, uh, you get an approved design from the doctor, everything fits and looks good. And then you go to this splitting the case um, into a bar and superstructure and then having to manufacture it and kind of everything has to be done right uh, for you to get the, the perfect final prosthetic. Austin, question for you. What's the uh, axial wall uh, taper that you use for the bar, right? Obviously, if if... Uh, if it's not tapered enough, you're going to battle undercuts, but if it's tapered too much, you might not like the retention. So what are you going for in the taper of your wall on the bar design? That's right. So if we were to leave them at a straight 90 degree uh, parallel walls, it would just make the manufacturing really tough. Um, not to say that it would be an improper design. It would actually keep that lateral movement of the superstructure really stable. So we go for about 10 or 15 degrees of this axial taper. Um, in If you're using Blender iBar for this, that process is actually called angle bar, and it will mm. tip in these axial walls. Uh, but like you said, you could go too far and sort of uh, alleviate the retention or that axial stability. Um, so we go for about 10 or 15 degrees of axial angle. And then how big of a chamfer do you place uh, at the, the margin line of the bar? Our margins are roughly about a millimeter thick uh, with a, a radius of a half of a millimeter. Um, and that is done uh, in Blender iBar. It's called shrink middle. Um, so you can do that about two times will give you a nice chamfer. Um, mm -hmm. And then that radius is something that you have to design in. But... You know, we like to have our, our half of a millimeter tool go in and, and make that chamfer margin for us. Amazing. 
any any other pitfalls in you know nesting or design that you wanted to speak to with with the ibar strategy so i would say both hyperdent and millbox are great at achieving this um uh milling result can get excellent results from both um in hyperdent you just need to make sure you're marking your user defined areas inside the cavity um we'll do that maybe a series of three or four different user defined areas just identifying these undercuts and uh in in millbox it's called that cavity access so you can set user defined areas and cavity access manually uh, we do just to make sure that it's done uh, you know it will try to make its best guess or judgment but we always go in and confirm or correct that cavity access um, so just maybe spending some time with your resellers yeah just get some training um, make sure you're nesting these things correctly and then you know if you have any trouble with fit of these parts together I'd be more than happy to to help you evaluate what's going on amazing and i wanted you to show before we end um running the milling simulation right so when yeah. you're in mailbox you you take the extra time to run the milling simulation that's a step you take to give yourself confidence that everything's going to work out so why don't you you know walk us through what you do why you do it and what you're looking for during the milling simulation Sure. So what I've done is I just restarted that same job. So I hit restart and then play. And what this will do, uh, this is a simulation of what the mill is being told to do from the cam software. Uh, so you have a representation of your puck holder, the arms, all the tools, um, your fixture, basically every part of the mill. And so what we're looking at uh, primarily is that difference is called deviation but basically how well something is going to mill out um, so you can let this play all the way through or you can take this slider bar and just pull it to the end it'll take about uh, you know 30 seconds to calculate or so but we do this before we press start on the mill um, these prosthetics can take a couple of hours to mill um, and, and we don't want to waste the time. Not necessarily is the material the most expensive part uh, in our, you know, in this process. Uh, the material for zirconia, PMMA, and titanium is all relatively affordable. Um, one thing that we're all limited to is 24 hours in the day. So yeah. if these jobs can take two and three hours to mill or in the titanium mill even longer, um, that time we just can't get back. And it can be as simple as just, you know, not putting that cavity access right. And now you've got to restart. You've got to go back and re-nest, recalculate, remill. You know, it's just really time consuming. So I think uh, the biggest saver for us is time. And, um, you know, with these simulations, primarily what we're checking here and today is how well these things are, are milling in regards to how we designed them. Um, but if we ever have a tool break or, you know, something go wrong, we'll say wrong in the mill, but, um, we can really try to identify what happened based on the line of code that the mill is stopped on the tool that it's using. And we can go and use this as a, a, a really important tool for us to, to figure out what's going on in the mill. So when you're running the milling simulation, like what are the main things you're looking for to have confidence that everything's going to work out okay? Uh, in the, are you talking about these individual, like, uh, different tool paths? What are we looking for? Yeah, like, you run the milling simulation. What do you want to see to know that this, this is going to mill out okay? Well, as far as the result, this green-gray camo, seeing that okay. means it's going to be perfect. Um, some things that I've identified in the software, let's say, uh, for instance, we were breaking some one millimeter tools. So I would go and I'd identify in the, in the simulation, all the jobs that were using this one millimeter tool. Um, and one of them was finishing the inside of this prosthetic. Mm. So you can imagine the milling time was quite long because it's using a smaller tool. Um, 
And, you know, what I did was just inside Millbox, you can just make this change. You can say rather than doing it with the one millimeter, do it with the two millimeter so that reduced our milling time. It reduced the amount of burrs being broken. Um, and then having this simulation tool, you know, we were able to see with making that tool change, are we still achieving the result that we want? So it allows you to test a different tool, a thicker tool that's going to cut faster, not be so prone to break, but then you want to see visually a prediction of, will I achieve the output geometry that I'm going for? Yeah, that's exactly right. One of the newer tools that we've implemented are these uh, four and three millimeter single flute roughing tools. So if I, if I run this simulation, you'll see um, kind of how much material is being removed at once. Mm. Um, so rather than, let's say most mills come out of the box running a two millimeter burr as the largest, um, you know, it can take significantly longer just to rough these parts out. Uh, we're seeing the roughing of these two prosthetics in about um, 25 minutes a side. Wow. So what's your total mill time, would you say, for titanium on average and your mill time for zirconia on these, uh, the bar and the superstructure? Uh, titanium bars all on four, we see them in about, uh, about six hours, maybe four to six hours. And then cases that include pterygoids, uh, we see those in about six to eight hours. Um, and really, you know, you can speed things up quite a bit. Uh, I'm not a high production lab by any means, so we're not necessarily crunched for time. We're crunched for perfection and results. So mm. yes, we want things to mill quickly, um, but not to compromise the final result. Uh, so the bars are taking anywhere between six and eight hours, sometimes a little less. Um, and then the superstructure is there right at about an hour and a half. Okay. So you're looking at uh, between seven and nine hours for both both process and you run two different mills what what mill do you use for titanium and what mill do you use for zirconia same yeah. or different a, a, a lot larger mill for the titanium mill so the brand that we run is xt sarah and we have the 500 model as the zirconia and pmma and then we have the 600 model for titanium awesome well, austin thanks for your time thanks for sharing um yeah anytime Anyone here that wants to book some time with Austin, Austin is available to help you at rebel3d.com forward slash Austin uh, him, himself and other experts are at rebel3d to help with mailbox, hyperdent, design strategy, um, really whatever you as a clinician needs or anyone on your team or you as a dental technician needs to troubleshoot these advanced cases, milling strategies, making sure that your titanium bar is designed correctly, is going to mill correctly, and that your zirconia superstructure is going to be designed correctly and mill correctly. Um, Austin, thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, very welcome. Very welcome, Rob. It's always great to talk with you.